Okay, now we're going to look at how we counter the adverse yaw to execute the coordinated turn. So to maintain the zero side slip, which is the definition of coordinated flight, we need to use the other control services other than just the ailerons in order to eliminate the adverse yaw. And the main solution is to use the rudder to create a yaw moment Uh, that equal and opposite to the adverse yaw. So if I draw this out, the top down view of our aircraft, there's a propeller on the front, here are our wings. And there's the tail, there are the ailerons, there's the elevator, and there is our vertical tail with a deflected rudder. There's the rudder, there's the elevator, and there's the ailerons. So, this is the CG of the aircraft. So, we have an adverse yaw from the ailerons in that direction. And then, with the uh, rudder deflected this way, we get a yaw moment from the rudder. So, what we see here is the rudder being deflected. So now we've involved the rudder, uh, question remains, should the elevator be involved in some capacity as well? Um, so what, the, what does the elevator do? Well, one way that we can think about the elevator is that it changes the aircraft angle of attack. And so using that, we can change the total lift. So let's look more carefully at a coordinated turn to see how much, if any, additional lift is needed. So to turn, the aircraft uses roll, as previously discussed. So if we now look at a picture of the aircraft from the front, and this should look familiar from some of the force studies we've done previously, the lift is going perpendicular to the wings. This is at a roll angle phi. Weight acts straight down. And again, there's the roll angle phi. And in the plane out of the page, the, for the thrust force equals the drag. So to maintain altitude, the lift times cos phi must equal the weight. So rearranging L equals W over cos phi. Now, since cos phi is always less than or equal to 1, the lift must be increased for any non-zero roll angle. So this aircraft's flying forward out of the out of the page at some speed v infinity, and th therefore there, there's an unbalanced force to the right here of L times sine theta. So from this we can calculate the turning radius. The acceleration A is L sine phi over M, the mass of the aircraft. And since the acceleration is perpendicular to the velocity, we have a constant speed term. So ma is m v infinity squared over the turning radius. And so L sine phi over m plus v infinity squared over r turn. Then if we start putting all this together, we get our turn is 
m v infinity squared over l sine phi. Uh, but recall that l is w over cos phi. So l is mg, which is the weight, over cos phi. So then, if we put all that together and simplify, we get that the turning radius is v infinity squared times the cotangent of phi over gravitational acceleration. So the turning radius is related to the roll angle, the speed, and our gravitational acceleration constant. So now, also recall that L is W over cos phi, and that's greater than W for any uh, non-zero rolling angle. So if the aircraft was trying to fly at the same speed, V infinity, before the turn, and wishes to maintain that speed in the turn, the lift would have to be increased. But the thrust and the drag haven't changed significantly. So we must use the elevator to increase the angle of attack uh, and therefore the lift coefficient. So the aerodynamic limit on the aircraft turning radius is set by the amount of lift coefficient margin between level flight and the turning angles of attack. This is also something you may see referred to as a load factor. And that'll come up in uh, the fourth year course, Aerodynamics and Performance. Um, for now, this is all I want to say on aircraft uh, maneuvering and controls. We'll talk a lot more about this in the course next year.